there is uh, a lot of discussion about whether NMO is um, a spectrum of disorders. And uh, so what we've noticed on NMO is that there are a lot of very different um, clinical outcomes and radiologic signs that occur with uh, NMO in uh, different than MS. So we have patients come in with difficulty seeing in one eye and maybe some neurologic signs, uh, numbness or tingling on their arms. And so we get a MRI and people, uh, the radiologists discuss that we have a enhancement in an optic nerve. What we've been seeing and what um, neurologists across the country have been uh, noticing and writing about for the past 10 years is that uh, there is an association with how long the enhancement is in an optic nerve. So for optic neuritis, you can have a, a short amount of enhancement in an optic nerve, but usually the enhancement is more posterior in an optic nerve closer to the chiasm in NMO, and it is more long, <laughs> longer. Longitudinally extensive could be a word that you use, but longitudinally extensive also uh, discusses uh, some of the findings of um, enhancement within the spinal cord. And people uh, associate NMO with transverse myelitis. And so we call it this longitudinally extensive transverse uh, myelitis. Aquaporin 4, IgG, is very well correlated with this disease. It's a calcium, it's a water channel. And uh, so this antibody is uh, controlling the water channels within the nerves and it's very highly associated. Go. Yeah. Am I projecting well? Okay. Um, there's certainly more urgent need for treatment than in MS. In optic neuritis, you know that patients normally go through a period where they have abnormalities with their vision and then they do recover vision very well. In NMO, they don't recover their vision. They have a very long course of visual loss. And even if we try and treat them with steroids initially, assuming maybe that they have MS, they don't get better. And even if you treat them with IVIG and plasmapheresis, um, they don't have as much of an improvement as we have seen in MS and optic neuritis in the past. So it's this very different entity from multiple sclerosis. There was um, this visual outcome study um, from Brazil where um, all but uh, one of the patients with NMO were treated with IV methylprednisolone. And the suspicion of NMO is raised if um, patients have a severe visual field defect. It was lowered if they had complete visual field recovery. So we assume, and we've known from the optic neuritis treatment trial, that if you treat with IV steroids, that they about 95% of patients almost recover to 2025, 20, 2020 in their vision and their peripheral visual field deficits resolve. But in NMO, it doesn't. And so this is a, a very scary disorder for people until they realize that it was different from MS. Um, for an evaluation of optic neuritis, we suggest an MRI brain. And MRI orbits, absolutely, if you can add that onto your MRI brain, that's great, but recently insurance has been denying both of them instead of just one or the other. So uh, this study in um, neurology, Journal of Neuro Neurologic Neuroscience showed uh, a longer segment of that optic nerve enhancement in NMO, over 17 millimeters, and uh, certainly more posterior, as uh, what I was describing before. And then looking at that MRI brain, Identifying whether um, it shows um, some of the classic findings of where T2 lesions are in MS versus lesions that can be primarily in the brain stem that is a common finding in NMO and these spectrum of diseases that are, are now starting to be clumped into NMOSD or neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. If the brain is normal, we need to start checking for inflammatory and infectious causes. Certainly inflammatory such as ANCA and ANA, as Dr. Katz was mentioning. So uh, this 
article from Japan also showed that 30 to 50 percent of NMO patients had brain lesions that looked like MS. But um, I think that there's this radiologic overlap that a lot of um, radiologists can um, hear optic neuritis and a lot of people can still think of MS and some of these they see T2 hyperintensity enhancing lesions, then um, our thought is for MS. And so we need to start to distinguish and radiologically identify exactly what looks like MS lesions and what looks like NMO. And of course, the brain is never going to be able to have classic lesions of NMO and classic lesions of MS. There is still some crossover. So we'll have to do more work in identifying what are um, and where the lesions are. But um, NMO isn't, um, we can't fully distinguish if we're looking at a brain MRI between NMO and MS. So why um, should we look for ANCA? Usually about 30 to 40 percent of patients with NMO have these associated disorders. Sjogren's, SLE, thyroid, myasthenia. There was this article that uh, Kathleen Degree actually found um, and I'm uh, not going to pronounce uh, the name of the author, but uh, published in 2014. And they looked at 269 patients with presumed NMO spectrum disorder and um, 595 controls. The controls were found to be patients um, that had ischemic stroke, Guillain-Barre, and myasthenia gravis. Now, MS was included with NMO, recurrent optic neuritis, and recurrent longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis in the uh, case, cases. ANCA positivity rates were low in all patients. 9.5 had P ANCA positivity and 2.3 had C ANCA positivity. So 82 patients were positive for ANCA, P ANCA and 19 were positive for C ANCA out of 864 patients. That's a lot for me because when I was looking up how, what the prevalence of vasculitis is, I only found this article about incidence of vasculitis, which is new cases are about 10 to 20 cases per million per year. So the overall rate of ANCA positivity and ANCA associated vasculitis, vasculitides is very low. To have such an abnormally high rate of ANCA positivity, 9%, is extremely high. So uh, th there were 72 patients with NMO, 21 with um, recurrent longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And so they broke down all the patients that had um, a, um, a demyelinating idiopathic disorder. Um, these were the percentages of C ANCA positivity and P ANCA positivity in the number of patients that they had. So they had with monophasic transverse myelitis, longitudinal uh, extensive transverse myelitis, you had rates of 22%, 14%, very odd from the natural um, prevalence that you might assume in uh, population. They also found a higher occurrence of ANCA in patients with the NMO SD rather than patients with MS. And there was a very high positive association between spinal cord lesions and ANCA. So um, what they did then was they checked everyone who had um, the antibody that is presumed to be associated with NMO. Now, that's, it's not a very sensitive antibody. You can still have NMO even though you don't have the antibody. And what they found was ANC-positive patients who did have this antibody and also were diagnosed as NMO patients, they were older. They had higher disability status when they started. They had more other antibodies that are inflammatory antibodies, ANA, ACE, you know, lysozyme, other inflammatory antibodies. They had longer spinal cord lesions and fewer brain abnormalities than ANCA-negative patients. So they were discussing these poth possible pathogenic roles for ANCA and how vasculitis can um, affect neurons and affect endothelial cells. 
and um, that the endothelial cells, ANCA activity um, attacking the endothelial cells might cause more vasculitic damage. So um, NMO is, think of it more as a, a vasculitis and a neuronal um, demyelinating disorder in combination than MS as a demyelinating disorder. Thank you. Thank you.